Good afternoon. Welcome to our lunchtime seminar. We're just going to give people a couple of minutes to get admitted um, onto the webinar and then we'll get going to keep on time. Uh, we accept people will probably join us as we're going along. Bit of housekeeping just to begin with. Um, as you all know by now, if you can put yourselves on, on mute and if you're going to ask a question, that'd be really helpful. And um, we will use the uh, hands up function for questions at the end. Um, and we're going to record the session as well, uh, unless anyone's got any uh, objections to that. So hopefully you can see Hannah's opening slide. Everyone see that? Yeah, good. Oh, that was a fancy thumbs up. Welcome to those who've just joined us. Thanks very much for dialing in to our lunchtime webinar. Uh, just to say if you could put yourselves on mute, that'd be fantastic. Uh, so I'm going to get going now. People will join us as we go along. My name's Ian Woolhouse. I'm the Quality Improvement Lead at HQIP. Um, I'm going to chair this lunchtime webinar and it's uh, with great pleasure that I introduce um, Dr Hannah Wright, who is the Clinical Fellow currently at HQIP, who's been doing some really interesting work looking at how uh, we might engage junior doctors more with clinical audit and quality improvement. So the plan is that Hannah's going to give us uh, uh, go through some slides and present some feedback on her work over the next 20, 25 minutes. Then we've got um, plenty of time for questions and discussion at the end of that, um, which I will lead at the end. So I'm going to hand over to Hannah now. Thanks so much, Ian, and thank you everyone for uh, joining today. Um, so uh, as Ian's discussed, I'm going to present today um, on my project that I've taken on this year, looking at awareness and engagement with the National Clinical Audit and Patient Outcomes Programme among doctors in training. So just an overview about what I'm going to discuss today. So I'll give a bit of context as to who I am and, and how this project was born. I'm going to share my story as um, of working as a core medical trainee um, about my sort of engagement or knowledge of national clinical audits. Then I'm going to share some of my survey and interview results that I've got from speaking to trainees uh, this year through this project. I'll touch on some of the work I've done in HQIP and, and with some others, uh, some other colleagues at HQIP uh, based on this work. I'll talk a little bit about what I think the potential benefits of involving trainees are and sort of bring it back to my experience and my story. Um, and then share some of the initiatives that I've come across um, from audit providers and, and trusts about what they've done to actually involve trainees. And then I'll hand back to Ian to open uh, the discussion. So just a little bit of context um, as to who I am and, and how I've ended up here. So I graduated in 2016 and then undertook my foundation training and core medical training. So four years of postgraduate training uh, in London. And then my core medical training finished in August last year, and I undertook this uh, fellowship at HQIP, which is, so my title is National Medical Director's Clinical Fellow, and it's a role that um, is sort of run by the Faculty of Medical Leadership and Management. And I was lucky enough to be placed at HQIP where I started uh, virtually last September. And when I was doing some of the pre-reading before I, I started this fellowship, I was reading a number of these sort of audit, um, audit resources and, and outputs on the HQIP website and looking at some of the audit provider um, websites. And I reflected on the fact that I actually really had a very poor understanding of, of sort of the breadth of this programme as a trainee. And when I had my initial meetings with uh, Jane Ingham, who's the uh, chief executive at HQIP and, and Danny Keenan, the medical director, who are my line managers, I reflected on the fact that I did have this this you know sort of poor poor level of awareness I felt of the program and that I felt it could have been really quite valuable for me as a trainee to have understood this better, and so that's really where this this project uh, was born from. And just to tell a bit of a story of my actual experience as a, as a core trainee, so in my CT two year, so 
again, my fourth year uh, post qualification, I did a six month stroke job. And stroke, as, as you will know, is one of the departments where the audit is really, the national audit is really integral to the day to day practice uh, of the job. And this is the Sentinel Stroke National Audit Programme or SNAP. And so whilst I was on this job, it was a busy hyperacute stroke unit job. I was very aware that SNAP was was ongoing, that we were collecting audit data. But this was more by way of the fact that I knew I had to document certain things in the notes and write certain things down in my discharge letters. As a trainee, I really didn't have any understanding about sort of really the bigger question of why we were doing this audit and why we were collecting this data. And I definitely didn't really know how I could have actually, you know, become inv more involved with it or actually used use some of that data and the outputs that were coming from that. And so what I actually did was I did four months of that job without really being involved in much improvement activity at all. And then towards the end of the job, you know, realised that I actually needed to do a project in order to, to pass the year. And so alongside one of my colleagues, and I think this is probably quite a familiar story and, uh, for a number of trainees, did what I'd call a bit of a tick, tick box project, um, sort of a quick win, um, which helped me pass my ARCP and pass the year. But I don't think was particularly enriching for me, nor, nor um, of great benefit to the department or our patients. So when I started this project, the first thing I did really was was survey some trainees to to find out if my experience was you know unique to me or if this was something that uh, more trainees had experienced and this took the form of um, just an online survey initially where I asked just some simple questions to start with so the first one as you can see on this graph here was are you aware of the national audit program and I surveyed over 100 trainees of all grades and um, what you can see here is that around 50% of trainees stated that they hadn't actually heard of or they weren't aware of the National Audit Programme. Around 10% stated they'd actively been involved with the programme and when I spoke to these trainees later in interview this largely was limited to data collection and a similar proportion so 11% stated they'd actually read, read the publications from the audits. And then 30%, I think this is the category I'd have fitted into, stated they were aware of the audits but hadn't really engaged with them or weren't really sure of their relevance. And asked the same question, as you can see here, for the Clinical Outcome Review Programme. And the numbers were similar, but actually more trainees stated they hadn't heard of this. So around 60% of trainees stated they, they weren't aware of this programme. And only 1% of trainees stated they'd actively been involved with it, which perhaps is not surprising given, given the nature of that programme. But again, only 11% of trainees actually stated they sort of read the publications and the outputs from these. And these findings align with some work that's been done previously, such as the learning to make a difference um, work uh, that the RCP did. I then went on to ask this uh, really interesting question that uh, Ian actually asked me when I joined HQIP which was how do you know you're doing a good job? And in the context of the, um, this, I actually asked trainees, how do you know your department is doing a good job? And what was clear here, some of these quotes actually summarise this quite nicely. Around 10% of trainees stated they had absolutely no evidence um, if they were doing a good job um, and they wouldn't know actually how to find out. The most common response to this question was feedback. So actually, and again, this was quite generic, so it could be feedback from consultants or other members of staff and also feedback from patients. Only around 10 to 15 percent of trainees mentioned um, sort of national audit or benchmarking to, to local or regional standards. Um, and other trainees sort of mentioned local audit or morbidity and mortality uh, meetings. But what was quite clear was that trainees didn't really weren't really able to sort of see this bigger picture um and didn't really know how to find out you know if their department was performing well or where to find this information and i think this is somewhere where quite clearly the national audits can actually fit in and really help sort of support this in a in a data driven way i then went on to ask trainees why they think their engagement or other trainees engagement with the program is poor and these are just a couple of quotes from the interviews and, and they're quite lengthy but i think sum up quite nicely what people were saying to me so this quote here on the left is from a senior anaesthetics trainee who talks about the fact that it's something that the consultants seem to take responsibility for and trainees are just told they have to collect the data or you have to fill in certain things. And this trainee describes when she discovered the hip fracture database and was quite amazed at the fact that you could actually compare yourselves to other hospitals. 
and sort of mentions, you know, why don't why don't you show trainees this? They this could really help hook this interest um, and take a bit more responsibility for this audit data and what goes on afterwards um, alongside the consultants. And this quote in, on the right here in green um, is from again from an uh, ED registrar who talks about the fact that actually did do some data collection for the audits that were ongoing in the department, but didn't really have any sort of idea about where you where their um, how their department was performing against these. And again, a couple of um, further quotes here. So this quote here on the right, um, again from an, another anaesthetics trainee mirrors quite a lot of what I found in my experience. So you're sort of aware that the audits are ongoing, but more by way of the fact that I think described as being hounded here, that you haven't fit in, uh, filled in certain things and don't really have that context of, of, of what's happening next, where this information is feeding into and, and you know, what, potentially why this is happening and where the improvements can happen. And again, on the left here, this is, this is from an Obs and Gynae trainee. So talking about the fact that as a junior trainee, didn't didn't really know about national audits and knew that Embrace, the, the outcome review program, was happening, but didn't really know actually what what that meant or why. So I then went on to ask uh, this question: So what are the barriers to quality improvement? And I think it's probably worth me mentioning why I I asked this uh, specifically about quality improvement. I think firstly, lots of the barriers for trainees being involved in clinical audit and quality improvement are, are quite similar. And I think at the moment, there's a, a really increased drive to getting trainees actually involved in the improvement side. So not just um, clinical audit, but actually how people use audit data to drive improvement. And this was really interesting. And as you can see from the word cloud, the key things that came um, out from here were lack of time so trainees stating that they didn't have the time in in the day or time in their rota to be able to undertake improvement activity but also the fact that they actually rotate through departments and hospitals quite frequently made it difficult to understand the context in which they were working understand which stakeholders needed to be involved or or potentially what's gone before and has or hasn't worked something that also came up really commonly was this lack of support so um you know perhaps clinical supervisors weren't interested in, in their area of interest or actually weren't particularly okay with quality improvement methodology and this lack of sort of mentorship through the process, which can be really quite difficult. Another couple of interesting things that came out, this difficulty in accessing data. So, you know, trainees talked about having to actually get patient records still and, and go through paper notes and also long delays to actually um, getting this data. And there's also this sense of resistance to change. So in organisations, you know, trainees being told that actually, um, you know, we can't change this or we've tried this before and this hasn't worked. And this sort of lack of organisational buy in was something that um, was was quite commonly talked about. And with this information, I had to think about where actually the National Clinical Audit or the NCPOT programme can help support this and, and break down these barriers for trainees. And I think there's a number of ways, number of things that really spring to mind about how engaging with the NCPOP programme can help break down these barriers. And these three arrows just point to some of the key areas I think that, that engaging with the NCPOP programme can really help. So in terms of difficulty in accessing data, well, actually, if trainees can register and access uh, the national audit portals and pull their local data from that, this can really actually help them getting access access to this data um, and this is data that hopefully has already been collected so actually saving time again in that data collection process. In terms of resistance to change I think if trainees are engaging with uh, improvement initiatives related to the national audit projects then this can really help with organisational buy-in and actually you know if you're working on an area that the national audit shows that your your trust needs to improve in then this can really help with you know stakeholder engagement and, and buy-in at a trust level and again these sort of dashed arrows show i think potentially a couple of indirect ways that engaging with the national uh, clinical audits can potentially help trainees so this perceived lack of support actually if you're able to you know find who the national audit lead is in your trust if there is one or actually the clinical lead for for a de department that has a national audit then potentially starting an improvement initiative with with 
um, you know, one of these consultants or senior registrars can really help with that support and mentorship through a project. Additionally, the this transience in departments actually, if you're working on um, again with national audit metrics, things that are already measured, this can really help with the sort of sustainability of a project. And perhaps if trainees can identify early where departments where um, sorry, national audits that they're interested in, you could actually engage with this work before you perhaps rotate onto that department. So I could have engaged with SNAP at the beginning of my CT one year and actually been involved in a project that was was much longer. And similarly, this you know, sort of bureaucracy, I think, again, if you're working on a on a, a project that has the national audit metrics sort of built into it, again, that can really help with that organisational buy in and really, really sort of being a trainees to able to push their project a bit more. I then asked trainees what they wanted to know, and this is a bit of a difficult one because you don't know what you don't know, but gave a bit of information about the programme before asking this question. And the things that people uh, told me came through quite clearly, so wanted to really understand what the programme mm -hmm. is and to get a sense of the broad range of audits and clinical outcome review programmes with, within the NCPOP. Wanted to understand actually what the impact of it is, so to help contextualise what the importance of actually kind of collecting this data and doing this work is. And then really it focused on actually how they could get involved with the national programmes, both with the actual data collection, but actually how to use the national programmes to support local quality improvement activity. So with this uh, information from sort of speaking to trainees and this initial scoping, I've worked um, with a number of colleagues in HQIP to create an e-learning module. So this is being created in conjunction with a regional health education England, so which has a, a, around four or five thousand trainees in their area. And also once uh, it's completed in the next couple of months, will be uploaded onto the HQIP website. And this training really focuses um, so, sort of four trainees about explaining what the National Clinical Audit and Patient Outcomes Programme is and focuses on how trainees can engage with this and, and use the outputs to support quality improvement activity locally. And it's it's video, video and text based um, learning, which has required me to sort of uh, learn how to make videos and all sorts, which has been a really interesting learning experience. And then um, was lucky enough to be joined by a final year medical student who was on virtual elective with HQIP um, a couple of months ago. And alongside her have worked to create a couple of new resources, again, which will hopefully be launched in the next month or so to the HQIP website. So the one on the left here is just a top tips guide um, for trainee doctors about how to get involved with the national clinical audits. And the resources on the right here is um, a summary of all the open access resources created by uh, audits and audit providers um, that can support quality improvement using the NCPOP. So why do I think it's important to involve trainees? So I think it's important to reiterate the fact that, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, every trainee has to undertake at least one audit or quality improvement project, they're called, per year for a curriculum requirement, um, which means actually in every organisation there's hundreds, if not thousands of projects going on every year um, by trainees. And often these are potentially quite small scale, potentially these tick box projects that I alluded to at the beginning. Um, and and actually it's just being aware that, that these are happening and trainees are doing these projects, but perhaps we could sort of better align these with the national programmes. I think it's fair to say that at least most trainees want to make a difference. I think as a trainee, it can be incredibly rewarding to feel like you're, you're making more of a difference than sort of the day to day job and actually creating sustainable improvement in a department you've worked in um, it is, is really important to lots of trainees. And I think effective engagement of trainees with this the NCPOP programme has huge potential and wide reaching benefit. So benefit for the patients, and, and this is why we do it to improve the quality of care for, for our patients, but also for the organisation that we're working in. So actually, if we can align lots of these projects with the organisational priorities or the priorities that are coming from the national audit programmes, yeah. then this potentially has huge benefit. And indeed for trainees, I think, you know, 
having done this year and engaged a lot with these programs and read the reports, I've learned a huge amount and actually being able to put this into practice and, and engage with the national programs and indeed use the outputs for improvement if possible can provide really rich learning for trainees. And I'll circle back to this bit um, at the end just to talk a bit more about my example from my stroke job. So now I'm just going to share some examples of initiatives that I've come across um, this year to involve trainees. Ooh, sorry. Um, and this isn't uh, by no means exhaustive. It's just the audits that I've ended up speaking to or things that trainees have told me. So this first one is um, the, na I don't know why that's doing that, sorry. Um, the National Emergency Laparotomy Audit or NELA. And they actually sponsor a trainee prize or two trainee prizes at the national conferences. Um, and these prizes are awarded to trainees for posters. So these are posters that actually um, look at how trainees have used NELA data to, to prompt or support improvement um, locally. And what they do with all of these submissions is that they then shortlist those and publish uh, these on the NELA website. Sorry, this is running on its own. Um, and this sort of creates a bit of a best practice compendium about quality improvement projects that have been going on locally, run by trainees. And um, at the conference, they pick a winner. And this is a, a small cash prize. But actually, I think for trainees, the main incentive is actually the fact that you're able to present a poster at a national conference and get a national prize. So I, I think, you know, the cash is probably nice, but it's more the the fact that you're able to actually present this work nationally, which is a really good incentive for trainees. The National Aspirin COPD Audit um, or NACAP, so they have a quality improvement work stream this year and as part of that they have got five or six trainees actually involved in their quality improvement steering group, so having a trainee voice on that group to help help shape the outputs. One of the things that they're doing as part of this is a quality improvement education program. And as part of this, they're training up quality improvement coaches. So around 15 coaches in England and Wales um, for a peer to peer sort of tra training um, about quality improvement and NACAP. And this quality QI coach role is open to all healthcare professionals, including uh, trainees. And um, the only requirement for this is that they're in post in the same place for a year for continuity. Um, but again, that's potentially a really uh, good way of involving trainees in this work. This is from the RCPCH, um, who uh, this is obviously pre-COVID, but run uh, quality improvement collaboratives and they actively encourage trainees to be involved in these programmes. And this slide just shows, oh, sorry, uh, this slide just shows a few quotes from um, trainees about um, their experience of actually being involved in these QI collaboratives. And whilst I think some of the comments have been that it's been quite difficult to actually get protected time or time in their rotors to be able to attend these, the RCPCH have sort of reiterated the importance of, of trainees being involved in these collaboratives actively. Um, just to touch on a few other examples that I've heard of. So, National Early Inflammatory Arthritis Audit, um, they have uh, funded, fully funded clinical fellows um, who work on their data analysis, but also on the project design and also have trainees that sit on their project working group. The Falls and Fragility Fracture Audit Programme or FAT, FAT have um, recently recruited four voluntary clinical fellows who work part time and they have a number of roles within the audit, including sitting on the QI advisory group. And then um, this is just a, a local initiative actually to involve trainees in national audit. So this uh, is actually at Kingston Hospital and at Kingston, when the foundation year doctors uh, join, they're able to rank um, sort of their areas of interest and then they're actually allocated audits to be involved in. And these are a combination of national clinical audit and local priority audits. And you can see here, these are a couple of quotes from uh, trainees who've actually been involved in the national audits. And I, it talks about both the learning sort of from a clinical point of view about data collection and also this quote here on the right, making people feel like they're part of something impactful rather than this sort of tick box that I um, described earlier. So I think that's an interesting way of actually getting trainees involved in the national audits. 
And then just uh, to finish off, I just thought I'd circle back to my example at the beginning and, and talk about if I knew then what I know now, what would I have done differently? So if I'd started that job and understood really what SNAP was and how I could have engaged with it, or perhaps actually at induction, if um, the clinical lead had given us a short 10 minutes, something about what the audit is and how we could have got involved. I think there are a number of ways this would have changed um, how I'd experienced that department and, and the improvement activity I'd taken on. So I really easily could have, have gone and sort of read the audit report or the executive summary of that and identified the key, the key sort of domains and indicators that are measured by the audit um, and just had those in mind whilst I was working on the job. So thinking about potentially areas that I may have seen that I could see sort of areas for improvement. Additionally, I could have then gone to our audit lead and um, registered to access the data. So actually been able to see how my trust was performing against these standards that are outlined in SNAP and and seen how we compared how we were performing to sort of other trusts in our area. And then I think with this information, I'd have felt really sort of empowered to be able to actually go to other members of the stroke team, go to my clinical lead and ask the question, you know, do you know how we're performing on, on this parameter? Is that there somewhere we could start an improvement project or is there something already ongoing and I think this would have been sort of much more enriching for me but also for the department led led to me doing actually a much more sort of meaningful project um, that likely would have been more sustainable. So um, I'll now hand back to Ian for a discussion sorry my slides keep running on at home um, just really to I guess initially try and share a bit of best practice and learn about what else we could do in this area. I know, thank you. Uh, that's fantastic run through of, of your work. Well done. Um, some really useful insights there into the opportunities that uh, trainees potentially offer to the National Clinical Audit and Outcome Review Programme, but also perhaps more importantly, the potential barriers that might need to be overcome. So um, excellent piece of work. Um, I'm going to open up for any comments or questions now from uh, the audience. So use your hand up function if you can find it, or if not, just shout out. Liz Fagan, I think, has got her hand up. Liz. Hi. Hi, Hi there. Liz. Hi. Um, I'm the project manager for the National Hip Fracture Database, um, so I'm sort of attending for um, us, the FAP programme, really. Um, so I just had a bit of feedback from the other project managers, if you wouldn't mind me running yeah, through that. Do, yeah, um, yeah. Well, it was great to see us mentioned for a start. Um, <laughs> I'll, um, I, this is being recorded, isn't it? So um, is there going to be a link sent round so I can, because we've got a few people on leave and, and a lot of us work part time, so not I'm the only one that's able to make it today. It'd be great if, if yes, everyone we'll else share, could. Yes, we'll share, share the link, Liz. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. Um, so in terms of engagement and awareness, um, you've mentioned our clinical fellows role. Um, so our main engagement with trainee doctors will probably be them and also research opportunities with our data. Um, and the other ways we're looking at is in, within specialisms and engaging with the projects like GIRTH, um, best MSK pathway. Um, we also have um, careful program which um, was has been viewed by trainee doctors I think it says um, they're required to complete the training and that helps them become familiar with well NAFE in particular but the FAP program um, is I've just got some feedback that as of December last year over five and a half thousand individuals have completed careful so um, mm. that's potentially maybe something that we could look at exploiting a bit more for want of a better word. <laughs> um, in terms of barriers, I think we've got definitely a lack of events last year and where there are events, they're not as interactive, there's not as much networking. Um, and uh, specifically for trainee doctors, their rotation through the hospitals, obviously they're not there for a particularly long enough time sometimes to complete these projects. These aren't necessarily things we can do anything about, I just um, decided feedback what the team have have sort of been brainstorming on. Um, and then seniority, so as you said trainee doctors might have the enthusiasm, 
um, but given the fact that they then move on, they might not feel that they have the authority to influence it beyond their um, sort of short period of time in the hospital. Um, and then under ideas, um, you looked at a centralised platform learning session, but that's obviously what you're, what you're introduced. And, and Hannah, we've spoken previously anyway, haven't we, about that and including our sort of how to videos on the audits. Um, we think that an individual audit approach would have limited reach to something that you guys are doing, which is more overarching for audits in general, um, would be really helpful. And um, we thought maybe in the learning sessions, you could highlight some of the collaborative work being done in the programmes. So um, we're running um, QI collaboratives this year across FAP for hopefully a total of nine teams, so three per work stream, um, which was more of a sort of uh, um, junior doctors can be a part of that um, and look at the data. So wow. sorry, just a just no, bit yeah, of a brain dump there, but yeah, I just no, thought while well, I had the opportunity, I just feedback caught the um with a couple of project managers and I said had thought about when we were, got the invite over. Yeah, lots of useful feedback. Hannah, did you want to come back on any of that? Yeah, no, I think it it that's really helpful. And I think one of the things that trainees have said a lot about the National Hip Fracture Database is that they can just click on the website and look at it, which I think really helps them. Yeah get a bit of a sense about the fact that, you know, that that comment on the case study, oh, wow, I could actually compare how we're doing yeah. against different hospitals. But it's letting them know it's there and the data's there and what to do with the data once it's there, once they see it, which is kind of why we made those how-to videos, but there's probably limited reach we can do with those in terms of, you know, Twitter and, and stuff. We, we need something like what you're doing and you've included them in, I think, to push it out further. Fantastic, yeah. Um, there was just a question in the chat about, are you going to write your work up, Hannah, Hannah as a report, and will that be available? I, I am indeed. That's work in progress, but it will be available. <laughs> Fantastic, OK. Um, so any of the other audit providers on the call who've got any kind of feedback in terms of what's worked for them or, or, or what challenges you've found trying to get trainees involved? I see Mark DeBelders on the all of these able to come in maybe from the cardiac side of things mark you've got a massive audit program there and lots of cardiology trainees my hospital's full of them so have you had any experience of um engaging them um yeah the danger of coming on these things is you get pointed out and uh, <laughs> you, so uh first of all i apologize hannah i missed the first few minutes of your talk but i got most of it so um, fantastic presentation I mean, we've got an interesting thing because I think the cardiovascular domain, of course, we've we've got seven different professional societies incorporated. So NICOR is the data sort of uh, process for all of that. It doesn't have a direct um, um, mandate within each of the societies. But what we try and do is influence those societies uh, with our various structures. And we're trying to uh, get everyone to actually to focus on this. I thought I thought that this was a very interesting opportunity for you to come and talk and describe that. I mean, in the cardiovascular domain, I suspect trainees, particularly in angioplasty, cardiac surgery, um, in the in the congenital uh, environment, they're probably actually entering quite a lot of the data into the databases uh, because there's a culture of entering data immediately after a procedure. So they are heavily involved, and I know in individual hospitals they do look at the National Audit uh, Programme, but we're trying to see if we can actually uh, uh, reach out in a better way to trainees to, to make that do it, but trying to coordinate this through seven different societies is, is quite difficult. But we have a, a process called the um, Professional Liaison Group, which is actually chaired by the President of the British Cardiovascular uh, um, Society, and also has the president of the um, Society of Cardiothoracic Surgery there uh, and all the presidents of the various societies. So we're trying to sort of big this theme up uh, as, a, as a work stream at the moment. But I, I was very impressed with your talk and um, I don't know if we can have access to the slides, but I quite like to use these slides to try and help promote uh, this process. Fantastic. I'm sure that will be possible as well at some point. Anna, yeah, great. She's nodding. Um, and I see Marissa Mason's on the call as well. If Marissa's 
able maybe to comment on the outcome review program side of things. Did you know that was coming, Marissa? Yeah, no, Joe, you know, I sort of had a guess that I'm, that might happen. And funny enough, I was just <laughs> I was paused to ask you. Ask ah, okay. <laughs> so actually, no, I was, I was, yeah, we've done we've done quite a lot trying to engage with trainees. Yeah, I thought you yeah. asked. And the problem is, obviously, trainees come and go, and then we do we do we get in quite well. And we had a, we worked with this chap called David Freeman, who was an anaesthetic trainee actually in um, in oh, Birmingham, and and he was brilliant. I mean, he he actually put together a document because it wasn't then about us engaging with trainees; it was trainees engaging with trainees, which was a lot more powerful. So he developed this whole document about NCPOD written by him, saying why it would be good to. Uh, be involved and this was some of the impact and the reports we'd done and how we could do it and then he got me to go around lots of all the hospitals that he was working across and where he'd come from where he, and actually where he went for a while um to go and like give a roadshow at trainee lunchtime meetings and, and obviously pre-covid uh, that was really positive again it's just that that sense that trainees don't know about us because they're not actively involved with what we do because the our questionnaires go to consultants although we do say to consultants get your trainees to fill these in and then check them because actually that's great learning for them you sign it off that's the other way we propose it um and that was worked really well and then of course he became a consultant and <laughs> that kind of work nobody took on that mantle so if you get the engagement it really is there and it's not a lack of willingness but it's, it's just that lack of knowledge um that are there to be used as you said i think actually hannah your work is brilliant and a really excellent presentation actually i was going to ask a question about that is what do you think the buzzword is you know for us as, as providers going out and trying to get engagement either with the trainees or with the consultants to try and make, give them the, the trainees the time and make them aware of it what's the buzzword or words that we should be using to try and jolt them into thinking oh actually maybe we should do this you know is it uh, I don't know, is it CPD, is it training? I'm not sure if you said, you know, we'll give you a thousand pounds, that would work really well. But if, you know, but if, <laughs> but if, if you know, what, what is the, the, I suppose just from a gut feeling, what is it that we could use to act as the trigger to make people sit up and listen? Yeah, really good question. I think for trainees, and again, I could think about this more broadly, but I think CVs and uh, sort of applications points for your CV is what's always in the back of people's minds. So, uh, you know, actually being involved in a national programme, you know, collecting national audit data, that, that can be important. And actually, you know, that is what seems to get people hooked, you know, talking about being involved in a national initiative and, and also, I guess, opportunities that then lead from that. Mm. And I think what is also important is explaining the context. That's what people seem to really lack in some of those qu quotes I've described. Actually, you know, why are we doing this? What is the impact? Mm. So people understand actually that this could be potentially beneficial for them. I think in a sort of selfish way as a trainee, yeah, you have yeah, to yeah. be a bit, but also actually giving people a reason, you know, why are you staying late after work to fill in some forms? Actually, if you can understand what the impact of that is or why it's being done, then I think that makes it a lot easier to mm. to, to buy into that. So, mm. yeah, I think they'd be my gut feelings. But again, I can think on that more. I don't know, Ian, if you have other thoughts on that as a consultant. Well, I suppose the, the only thing to add would be the uh, example you gave of the laparotomy audit and the prize that they run. And I think that fits in very well with what you've just articulated around having something tangible to to put down on your CV as well as having done some useful work. And to my mind, this is almost about you kind of investing for the future, aren't you? Because these trainees are the consultants and the GPs, et cetera, of the future who you will be expecting to really do the kind of quality monitoring and improvement work. So um, it probably is worth whatever, you know, 50 quid prize, or whatever it was <laughs> they were offering for the uh, laparotomy one. And Marissa, did you want to come back? Yeah, oh, no, I think that's true. Actually, yeah, we did it. We did. I think, but I think it's an ongoing process. And I think that's the thing. I think we all would like this to be sort of a fairly quick win and we go out, we engage with trainees and then they will remember when they become consultants. But of course, new trainees are coming through all the time. And, and because of that, it's an ongoing process. We've done posters, we've done prizes, we did a uh, an essay prize, we've done lots of things. And of course, you, you have to keep that momentum going, otherwise yeah. it, it drops off. And I suppose that's the thing that I would, that would yeah. be the thing that I'd share. I'm also interested in the surgical perspective on all of this. And I know we've got some uh, colleagues on from the RCS. Sam, um, excellent timing. Thanks. 
I hope, can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, we can. That's Thanks. great. Um, I was just going to give a brief perspective of what we do with the National Vascular yeah, Registry. So we yeah. are slightly beneficial in the way that it's possible to record multiple operators for each procedure. Um, and so often that will be a surgeon, you know, a consultant vascular surgeon and potentially a consultant interventional radiologist. But more than often, the trainee involved in the procedure is able to put their name and their GMC code against that procedure. Um, so that it's documented and it acts a bit of a logbook. So the trainees with their own logins can actually then access all of their data for the procedures they've been involved with. And they can use that in the same way that consultants do for appraisals. And I think that's really helped with the buy in. And I think similar to the the NICOR um, chap whose name I've forgotten off the top of my head, the with vascular procedures, often the, the data is actually entered immediately after the procedure and often that responsibility for the data entry um, is given to the trainee who's been involved with the procedure because a lot of the information that they're entering, especially that's related to the actual procedure itself, is going to be fresh in their head at the time um, and it's a lot easier and quicker to enter it at that point. Um, and I think secondly, in terms of engaging with trainees, um, through the, the data access request service, uh, a number of trainees have requested NVR data in the past and then presented it or you know, published either published papers or presented it at annual conferences. And I think that again highlights the importance and the relevance of this data. And um, you know, once one trainee presents something at the Vascular's annual conference, it you then get a tidal wave of a few others coming afterwards because they then realise what they can do with this data. Um, that's the national data, but also they they can access their own local data at any point and use it for their own quality improvement pro projects because um you know, frequently people come to us and ask for some data or metrics and we say, do you realise it's actually already available for you to, to download for yourself or view our automated online reports? And sometimes it's about getting that message across. Um, and I hope that with our current clinical fellows we have, or we have got one at the moment, we should be having another one in a couple of months time. They are both vascular trainees and I think by continuing with their messaging, it, it should help to sort of generate interest and show that what the NVR does provide. Thanks, Sam. That's that's really, really useful feedback and fitting in with some of the themes. Hannah, did you want to come back on any of that? Yeah, no, I think just a couple of things that the fact that it fits in with a portfolio and actually your trainees can really feel like they're sort of involved in that. I know it's similar to what they do in the National Ophthalmology Database as well. So you can actually pull your own results and use that for appraisal is, is fantastic. And similarly to um, what Marissa was saying, actually, that kind of peer to peer teaching. So actually your clinical fellows going out and telling their peers, you know, look, this is this is really useful. This is the information you can get, I think, is a really powerful way of, of sharing that that message as well. So actually getting consultants or other trainees to ex explain to others about how they've used this is important in sharing that message, too. Yeah, it just strikes me that having that level of information that's at the trainee um reported level is is quite crucial isn't it and it's not something that i guess many of the programs are able to do but that's su such a powerful thing having your own performance data fed back uh, uh, as opposed to your team's performance um and certainly within our organization we've got some experience of that with our junior doctors in terms of prescribing and use of our electronic prescribing system so they get a uh, they get a weekly report on their performance on that so it's ch it's changing that culture in terms of Actually, this is business as usual. But you're going to get regular performance feedback, and it will, you know, the, it, it will be positive as well as areas for improvement. Um, and that's really important to remember as well, isn't it? But there is a big cultural shift, I think, within the NHS that this needs to become business as as usual, and not just kind of a once a month um, governance event. I see we've got GB uh, Medina on from the RCS as well. I don't know whether you want to come in in terms of some more surgical aspects. Hello. Hi. Good afternoon. Yes, it was a really interesting presentation. Thank you, Hannah. It's got me inspired. Got a few ideas that we can try to implement for the NABCOP. Um, I think what I'm realising is, uh, you know, the idea of um, imp improving our website. I mean, we have a high number of resources there, things like the local action plan that teams can download and actually plan their actions to meet the recommendations of the audit. But I'm thinking it's always if you can improve the number of clicks before people see something that grabs them. Um, we have a lovely data viewer that we've produced over the last few years and it allows people to look at their 
data quality and their performance against a couple of indicators, and they can compare themselves against other local teams. But I think we still find, even though we have a good number of people going to that web page that we monitor with Google Analytics, I think actually if they had to go through fewer clicks, maybe if we presented something kind of closer to the original landing pages, that could be an improvement we could make. Um, so I'm also thinking not just what do we have now, which we think is nice, which we see the downloads and we get feedback on, but how to kind of make it even more visible. So um, I don't have a specific recommendation from us right now, but I've been reflecting, listening to everyone, so it's been ever so useful. Thank you. No, that's good. Thanks. Thanks, Tibby. Um, so, yeah, any other questions, comments, thoughts? seconds in case people are still thinking. No, I think it sounds like we looks like we've probably covered most things then I think Hannah. So I guess by way of just kind of summarizing and, and, and finishing off then. So I think what you've presented, I think we'll all agree fantastic piece of work, really useful. Um, you explained you are going to write that up will be available at some point in a report but this uh, recording will be available by our website in due course and Ollie I imagine we'll be able to update colleagues as to when that will be Ollie's nodding so that's good um lots of useful ideas and thought I uh, particularly as you know I'm really keen on the work you've been doing with Health Education England and and that online resource can't wait to see that when it goes live and I'm sure colleagues would also like to be able to um, to access that and also see what the feedback's like on that. So congratulations, I think that's a really important piece of work. Um, anything you'd like to say, Hannah, in, in conclusion? Um, really just to thank people for joining and that I'd be really happy for anyone to get in touch afterwards. I'll put my email in the chat. I'm sure some of you have heard from me already, but if anyone has any thoughts about other things we could do, you know, there's another clinical fellow coming after me at HQIP, um, you know, not just for accessing junior doctors, but also, I guess, their supervisors and consultants as well. I'd be really interested to hear that. Um, so I'll put my email in the chat now. That's fantastic. Thank you. So this, we hope, is one in uh, kind of the first in a series of, of lunchtime webinars on various topics. So we'll keep you uh, updated as to what's coming when and next. But just to say again, thanks once more to Hannah for a great presentation. Thanks everyone for dialing in um, and for your questions and thoughts. So uh, have a good rest of the day and we'll see you all soon. Thanks very much.